uh, but it's still minimal, yeah? so it doesn't leave that, that plane here that's opening to the back. Uh, and, and so on. Yeah? So this is full of uh, these yellow, um, uh, merely minimal functions, uh, and then at the corners there are infinitely many uh, of uh, those uh, extreme functions. Above there are uh, these non-minimal functions. This is another classic integer programming cut. It's a Gomery fractional cut, uh, and uh, this is hovering above uh, both the Gomery mixed integer cut and uh, this uh, strong fractional cut. Uh, so uh, there are yeah, some points where it's bigger, uh, other points where it's equal. And we have a whole zoo of these functions. Uh, there's an, uh, we have collected an electronic compendium of the, uh, these things. So this uh, was uh, early uh, work uh, with my uh, former student, mm -hmm. Joe. Uh, so we have uh, uh, basically you know, uh, come th uh, the literature uh, on these uh, functions. Uh, and uh, so we, we have software. So it's, uh, this is actually, uh, it's not just a zoo of functions. It's actually, it's a petting zoo. So we can we can grab these functions uh, and uh, we can you know investigate them um, and uh, there's you know for example software to uh, uh, verify uh, that these functions are indeed minimal. So we have algorithms for that that they are extreme and, and things like this. Yeah. Uh, so how, how did you plot BCBS? I know. Yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, so let me just say. Yeah, so there's a there's an escalation in uh, in craziness uh, in these functions. Uh, so the, the early functions, uh, and in fact, uh, Gomery and Johnson built continuity into their definition. So the first function are all continuous. In fact, they are, they are all piecewise uh, linear. Uh, and so they held the conjecture uh, for, for a while uh, that you know, um, uh, all of these extreme functions actually have to be continuous uh, uh, piecewise linear functions. But then this is uh, PhD work from, from Amitabh from 2010, I guess, or 2009. Well, Proved in 2008, but yeah, it appeared finally in 2010. Uh, so this is, uh, is a, a kind of like a, a fraction, uh, kind of like a fractal uh, function. So uh, it's not piecewise linear; it has infinitely many pieces. Yeah, it's, it's like that Cantor's devil staircase. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then uh, we discovered some uh, functions with lots of slopes. You don't see the slopes here, but it has 28 different slopes. So it's, uh, it looks like these are straight lines, but they're actually not. Uh, so if you see a, a slight rainbow there, it's because there are 28 uh, colors representing different, different slopes. Um, Amitabh and friends have uh, found a, a, a general construction of something that has an arbitrary number of uh, slopes. So these are all extreme functions. Uh, and then there's this whole, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a section in the zoo for the discontinuous functions. Uh, and um, this one here, uh, yeah, this is from uh, from Amitabh and uh, friends. Uh, it's a function that is continuous everywhere. It uh, fills uh, this uh, this strip here densely. Yeah, so the graph is dense in uh, in R times uh, zero uh, zero one. Uh, and uh, you have also you have some some other interesting functions there also. This one is a piecewise linear discontinuous function that has very very peculiar properties. Uh, so so we spent some work on on examples. Uh, and uh, so this is available for you know exploration. Uh, it's it's out there. Is that BCDS really a, some sort of faithful? Uh, That's its plot. Would you disagree that it's? Uh, the, 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 the <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't even know how you no. would plot something like that. But <laughs> yeah, it's 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 gray, it's gray, a gray okay. indicating yeah. that you know it's only dense. It's not. Uh, you know, uh, so, but in fact, in fact, we have an, we have an implementation of your function. Wow. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, we can evaluate uh, it uh, for uh, inputs that are real algebraic. Nice. Well, uh, uh, in fact, yeah, so I can show you the code. Yeah, so we have an actual implementation. We can uh, can do things with your function. Um, okay. So uh, so that's uh, so that's that. So let me go back uh, to an important notion. Uh, so let's see. I'm, I'm probably terrible with keeping the time. Yeah. So uh, let uh, the lunch be postponed until two. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'll be I'll be quick. Uh, so uh, I would like to know, and that's the that's a key question. So the testing minimality is easy. We figured it out. Um, uh, and um, so we would like to know whether a given function is extreme. And let's say we want to figure it out for functions that are input as you know piecewise piecewise function finitely many pieces uh, on on the fundamental domain on zero one. 
uh, and I would like to know, well, is it, is it extreme? Uh, and um, one can ask more detailed questions. In integer programming, uh, we like to talk about lifting of uh, valid inequalities, so it's, uh, it's uh, various processes uh, that uh, take, a, take a weak inequality and makes it stronger. Yeah, so geometrically, it means like you, know, uh, you have maybe a one inequality that's tight at one point, and you tilt it slightly so it's tight at more points, maybe becomes less at 25. We would like to uh, do similar things here as well. Uh, and uh, so, so actually, uh, the, the theory that uh, we are developing for uh, you know, just testing externality uh, actually will tell us uh, also things about you know, how to do this lifting process. Okay, so let me uh, do the following thing here. Uh, we, t we start from a minimal pi, minimal uh, patronary function pi, uh, and I would like to say uh, that uh, function pi tilde is an effective perturbation function if uh, I find some uh, yeah, positive uh, epsilon uh, so that uh, pi plus minus epsilon pi tilde is still a minimal function. So that means it is a direction in which I have wiggle room in both directions. And so that uh, certifies, uh, if I have this pi tilde, it certifies that I was not extreme yeah, because I'm sitting right in the middle of some line segment. Uh, and then you can imagine if I choose somehow this epsilon uh, to be maximal in some direction, then I, I kind of am hitting the next tight point of sorts. Yeah? All of these notions are a little bit tricky because this is, uh, there are infinite dimensional things happening, uh, but we can work with that. And uh, so uh, the trick here is um, uh, yeah, I introduced this scaling factor epsilon here, and uh, so um, this actually gives me a whole vector space. So I get a, get a space that I can attach to any minimal function, and it tells me uh, the space of directions into which I have this kind of flexibility. Yeah? And so what I want to do is I actually want to compute a description uh, of uh, this entire space. And then when the space is trivial, uh, then, well, the function was extreme and it's an even only if. Yeah, but I get more, I get a full uh, description of the space. Uh, and um, uh, so let me skip uh, literature. And so, so this has been the core of uh, our project that you know, we started with, uh, with Amitabh and uh, my then uh, PhD student, uh, Robert Hildebrand. Uh, so this was our first uh, first paper uh, on on this, um, you know, this one dimensional case um, uh, that uh, basically dealt with uh, piecewise functions that have rational breakpoints, uh, and um, it uh, essentially gives a pseudo polynomial algorithm uh, to decide extremality by um, forming a large grid. Uh, so basically, if you are if, uh, if you do things over denominator 7, uh, you are somehow you're working in dimension 7, a uh, grid like this. If you, are, uh, in, uh, if you have denominator of 7 billion, then you lose. Okay? Uh, and so that, uh, I, I was not happy, uh, happy with this. It was, it was, a, it was, a, great, was, a, was a, a great uh, uh, collaboration, this paper. But I was not happy uh, with the fact that, you know, we are, um, we, we, for example, we have no chance uh, with this one to do um, irrational inputs. Or just you know to say that you know um, we are given some function maybe of the numerical kind where we are not quite sure what are those uh, what are those um, you know what are those exact rational coordinates of these breakpoints maybe it's just something that I know vaguely in a floating point way and so what uh, what, are, what what should I be, be doing there and um, so um, I really wanted um, you know. Uh, to have a more general method that can deal with huge denominators uh, and also can deal with uh, irrational input because if you think about it, uh, and so I'll say that for, for YouTube on record, floating point numbers are kind of irrational, right? <laughs> um, okay, so um, and um, uh, so we had a, had a few papers with Amitabh uh, where we extended things to a higher dimension, but uh, with, um, uh, uh, with uh, after Amitabh left, somehow I had to continue, right? Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, with uh, with this undergraduate researcher and uh, with my uh, with my PhD student Yuan Zhou, uh, we uh, continued uh, on kind of effective questions for the one-dimensional case, and so this one here is uh, somehow it's a, um, a paper that we are very happy with uh, that you know uh, solves uh, large uh, parts of this of this irrational case by using this uh, inverse semigroup theory of the title. And so I'm almost uh, at the end of my talk, yeah. So, uh, so let me introduce um, uh, the. Uh, we still the, have about ten. 
10 minutes, yeah, uh, main, uh, main theorem uh, of this paper. And so it's a, it's a theorem that, you know, um, uh, grew uh, in its escalations of generality. So we had the first version uh, with, uh, with Amitabh and Robert Hildebrand. Uh, and um, so the most general version is now in, um, uh, in a paper that's on the archive. Um, and it goes like this, yeah, we're taking this minimal function uh, several assumptions. There's uh, we want a piecewise linear function, so it means uh, finite many pieces on the fundamental domain, uh, and I want rational breakpoints. Also, um, and so that was the first escalation in, in our paper number one, and then uh, we basically find out that there's a, there's a way to uh, decompose the the space into two types uh, of uh, functions. There's something finite dimensional going on and something that's not quite so finite dimensional. Okay. Uh, and so let me explain uh, the, uh, the most uh, uh, refined uh, version. Uh, so if you're taking, uh, you taking a function that is no longer restricted to have rational breakpoints, but we can have uh, arbitrary uh, real uh, breakpoints, and you need a technical condition of uh, uh, it's, okay, so we, we need continuity on one side of the origin, and uh, so the, it's a technical uh, restriction that is a little bit hard to explain. Uh, we have a paper on it that demonstrates that all hell breaks loose if, uh, if we have a function that is uh, discontinuous uh, on both sides of the origin. Okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do this, and then we claim the following thing. Uh, there is a, a computable direct sum decomposition of the space into this uh, finite dimensional space, uh, which I can explicitly determine because it will just be the solution space uh, of a uh, of a finite system that we can finite linear system that we can write down uh, directly, and uh, then uh, the uh, the other part of the space uh, decomposes further. There are finitely many uh, finitely many um, uh, direct summons, and uh, they are basically copies. Uh, of uh, the space of Lipschitz functions on a compact set with zero at the boundary uh, that are transported uh, to other places uh, of uh, the support uh, by uh, uh, computable inverse semi-group action, whatever that may be. Okay, so I'll explain, uh, I'll explain uh, that a little bit. So let me uh, just uh, motivate a little bit the kind of uh, you know uh, action that we are seeing. Here. So this one, so here's a particular function. Yeah, so it's uh, a function with uh, several slopes. Uh, and uh, it's minimal, and, and so here you see the description of the space. So uh, this part here is a finite dimensional space. Yeah, so this is three dimensional, so there, uh, there's a particular choice of basis of, of these. Uh, uh, so we have one, two, uh, three uh, uh, functions here. They're, they're designed on a particular grid. Uh, so um, there's probably there's a one level 24 grid here, and so we get these functions as interpolations of some things are somehow solutions to uh, linear equations uh, on that grid. Yeah, fine. Yeah, so I'm more interested in this part. Uh, so um, we are able to compute um, this little interval here, and then we have the following property. Um, I can choose any Lipschitz function on this interval. Uh, so here I have just a uh, little uh, sawtooth function where I can choose any Lipschitz function here, uh, and then I have a recipe how to copy uh, this uh, Lipschitz function to other places here. But this one here involves a flip like this. Okay. That's and what you mean by Lipschitz per permutation is adding a Lipschitz function? Okay. Yeah, so, so let's see. Yeah, so this one here is a, is a, is a, is a Lipschitz continuous function. Yeah, uh, and uh, it is zero at this boundary. It's uh, zero outside of these special intervals. These special intervals we call uncovered uh, intervals. Uh, that's supposed to be non-covered intervals. Uh, and um, so we, we know uh, that we can choose uh, these functions to be zero outside. In here, I have all flexibility. Yeah? So it's just uh, this variational uh, uh, property. Yeah? So you, are, um, uh, you have to be Lipschitz. Yeah? And you can choose any Lipschitz function. Yeah? So you have a complete uh, description of the space, actually. Uh, the only thing I need to do is like, somehow I need to um, describe the symmetry that's going on. Well, no, this uh, seems to be something really easy. Yeah? It's like, oh, okay, well, okay, so this function has to be odd about this point. Uh, so you just take this, you reflect this over. Yeah, and of course, we're able to describe this. Yeah? So in terms of, of group actions, it would say, yeah, um, all right, yeah, so there's, uh, there's an uh, element two, yeah, there's, there's an order two uh, group, yeah, so I see two, that is 
somehow uh, reflecting this thing over to here. No. Group actions are enough to describe the symmetry. And here's a second space. Yeah, so another special interval, the Lipschitz function reflected over. Yeah, again, same uh, same borrowing group that expresses this uh, kind of prescribed symmetry. Okay. Uh, but um, there are more complicated examples, like this one here, and there are seen slightly more general patterns. Again, there's a little uh, there's a little interval here, uh, and zoom in a little wow. bit. Uh, so there's a little interval here that's uh, for a fundamental domain on which I can choose an arbitrary Lipschitz function with zero at the boundary, and then uh, I have the following pattern. Uh, this one here can be translated over to here and translated over through there, and it can be reflected over to here and over to here and over to here. And so we can just ask, you know, um, with what kind of uh, algebraic structure uh, are we able to express uh, such symmetries? Yeah, abstractly, of course, we could say, well, it's just uh, you know somehow you know there's a I don't know C three C direct C two or something like this. Yeah, that, that does this, yeah? but we are interested in you know, an actual computational uh, characterization that expresses these things using kind of uh, affine maps. And so if you think about it, yeah, so consider the, you know, the affine transformation that takes uh, this, um, this one here over to this one. Yeah? And then you would uh, expect, well, uh, I can, exp uh, uh, I can uh, do the same transformation again, and uh, I get here. Yeah? But then if I continue another time, I get here, and there's, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. So somehow, uh, if I if I choose the language uh, of um, uh, you know uh, of um, you know uh, a finite um, uh, affine uh, groups that are acting here, they're somehow missing something. Yeah. And so that's that's actually a key observation if we study these these examples here. Um, uh, group actions are not sufficient to express uh, this in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah? And so. Uh, what we are looking for is a more uh, general way to express these types of symmetries. Yeah? And so this is where this idea of inverse semi-group actions uh, comes, comes in. Yeah? So let me just quickly uh, review uh, what, that, what that is. Everyone knows what a semi-group is. Uh, we are taking this uh, as you know, semi-groups of, um, of, uh, of functions under composition. Right? Uh, and uh, so these functions will be these kind of transformations. That's like, uh, sending uh, sending uh, this here over to here, yeah, so this will be uh, uh, such a uh, such a transformation. But then uh, there comes uh, 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 this one here. We call it, call it an inverse semigroup. If I have a semigroup where every element actually has a uh, has a pseudo inverse, yeah, so these ones are if you um, uh, if you remember uh, about you know uh, matrix algebra, yeah, so it has the notion of a pseudo inverse uh, and this has exactly these kinds of uh, properties here yeah so you take the uh, let's take an element uh, uh, and it's a pseudo inverse and you know uh, 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 it satisfies these two uh, two equations yeah and so these are exactly the inverses that we're looking for uh, and an inverse semi group you have uh, have a uniquely determined inverse of that of that of that kind yeah? and uh, so uh, we are now using uh, the uh, inverse semi group uh, of um, of uh, uh, of uh, functions of real variables that are only defined uh, on a restricted domain. So we are looking at translations that look like this. We take some domain, uh, and uh, you are just shifting some uh, some point x uh, by a, a particular vector t or a number t. But I consider this as really just a function on a on a particular domain. So we can draw its graph like this. Yeah, it will be oh, okay. We'll, I, I shift to uh, this is x, this is y. I read it off, so I get these little line segments that represent this partial function. And uh, in the same way, we also have reflections. Yeah, so take take an x, uh, and you uh, then you reflect it in, in this uh, in, in this way. And then we say that you know a function uh, is uh, uh, satisfies this symmetry pattern given by by such. Uh, translated reflection moves, or in other words, it's equivariant under this uh, semi-group action uh, if I have, uh, have this property. Yeah? So this one here is the translation is like a, a little a zig uh, like this uh, becomes a zig over there. Uh, and uh, this one here, uh, a zig becomes a zag uh, like this. Uh, so uh, it's, it's reflected like this and also like this. Okay, so that's, that's the equivariance formula uh, that, def that defines uh, the inverse uh, semi-group action. Yeah? And so now my, my point is uh, these inverse semi-group actions are actually suitable of expressing these, uh, 
uh, of uh, expressing uh, these um, uh, symmetries that we have observed, yeah, and and so, so then the project, uh, you know, uh, was able to focus uh, on uh, questions of how to actually compute uh, such uh, such, uh, such inverse symmetry groups that describe these symmetries. And uh, I have to skip a lot of stuff here, but we are going to um, uh, get um, uh, diagrams that look like this. That's particular data from the function that captures uh, additivity, local additivity of sub-additive uh, functions are given. We translate this uh, basically to uh, diagrams that look like this. Uh, they are um, uh, unions of graphs of uh, these these moves of these partial functions, as yeah, so we have some translations, some reflections, uh, and then uh, we are uh, computing computing closures with, uh, with respect to particular uh, axioms. So first of all, there are algebraic completions of the form. Yeah, so uh, I am forming uh, the inverse semi group that is generated by something. Then there's an order theoretic structure. So basically, if I have two overlapping graphs and I'm allowed to merge them. That's a little bit similar to what's happening in pseudo groups, uh, and then there are uh, like two topological uh, things, that, uh, things based on continuity uh, that we uh, that we use, and then there's another thing uh, that I don't. Oh, yeah, I have it here. Uh, there's a there's a, a mysterious property we call the kaleidoscopic uh, property uh, that we need, and so if we close with respect to all of these axioms, then uh, we are getting uh, pictures that look like this. Uh, then uh, we are getting uh, if, uh, uh, structures that look like this. There are finitely many uh, moves like this, uh, and then some mysterious squares and rectangles in these diagrams. And these uh, squares and rectangles uh, together they form something that we call a finite presentation uh, of uh, this, uh, what is called then the closed uh, move semi group uh, of the initial generators. And that that is what describes the that is what describes the um, uh, structure of the space. So, uh, I guess I was a little slow here, so I'll just uh, show you a final slide that looks nice. Okay, thank you. Questions for Matthias? Uh, how does this tie with that uh, image you had on your title? Uh, the title? Yeah. Okay, uh, I can uh, try to explain the title. Um, so we have an uh, infinite uh, dimensional uh, set, right? Uh, and uh, there's some uh, discretization going on, so we can read off uh, finite dimensional cutting planes uh, from the knowledge of uh, the uh, infinite dimensional space of uh, you know, minimal uh, functions and the ex extreme uh, functions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, last, my last page uh, is more, uh, more concrete. Uh, we have software, it's free software that runs in Python on top of Sage. Uh, this has uh, all the uh, things that you know, generates the kinds of figures that I, I showed you. Uh, and this has the uh, electronic uh, petting zoo of extreme functions uh, and, uh, uh, and, and various algorithms. Uh, so please feel free to uh, try this out. So the semi-group that you described is an infinite semi-group. That's right, yeah. But the is it possible to discretize it and still preserve the semi-group property? Um, yes, you can you can discretize, uh, but uh, uh, it is not not clear um, whether that captures everything that you need. Uh, so, so what we what we do is what we have is a is a is a kind of completion procedure. Uh, so uh, the problem with the completion procedure is that in in uh, some uh, very uh, simple irrational settings. It actually does not complete, uh, so it's, uh, it would um, continue uh, uh, infinitely. Uh, but uh, what we have is, is a particular shortcut uh, that we know, uh, something that we call the, uh, the strip lemma. It's basically uh, saying uh, if you have a particular uh, finite set of moves uh, under particular conditions, uh, then uh, actually I can uh, compute the, uh, the closure under these axioms uh, of uh, these moves, so I cannot. Uh, yeah, so uh, I can shortcut uh, something that would be an infinite computation and just compute this. Yeah, and so we we have uh, basically uh, one lemma of this form, and it is uh, until now an open question 
whether uh, this uh, lemma suffices to shortcut all uh, computations. Yeah, so that's an open question regarding the finiteness uh, of, this, uh, of this algorithm. Uh, all the examples of the irrational uh, uh, breakpoint uh, functions uh, that we have been able to construct. The construction is not quite so easy because uh, subadditivity is kind of a tricky non-local property of functions. Um, uh, uh, for all of those, our algorithm terminates. Uh, we know if it terminates, uh, then uh, uh, everything is, is nice. Um, but we don't know if uh, dollars terminate. And so we, uh, there might be uh, some, some really tricky functions hiding. Uh, Other questions? OK, so it's time for tears again. Uh, we plan to go for lunch now. Anybody's uh, free to join us. Uh, I, we haven't even decided. Where